Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. We'll get to today's episode, but first, a thanks to our sponsors, The Art of Leadership Academy and Belay. If you've ever thought you need more people in your corner, you've got to check out The Art of Leadership Academy. In it, you'll find a network of over 1,300 top church leaders from across the country and around the world in your corner who are ready to coach you. And I'm there to coach you too. All my premium content, monthly team training, and so much more inside the Academy. And it's all for less than the price of a conference, a course, or anything else you could possibly find. Check it out at theartofleadershipacademy.com. And again and again, I run into leaders who don't know who to hire and can't find the right people. That's where Belay provides such value. They'll do a free 20-minute consultation with you. I turn to Belay again and again for staffing, and they are the staffing solution I trust. So to book your free staffing solution, go to belaysolutions.com slash carry, and you'll get a 20-minute session to help you figure out what you need. And at the end of today's podcast, they'll give you some free tips on how to delegate to an expert from Belay. So make sure you watch for that. Check it out. And now to today's episode. Rory, welcome to the podcast. Carrie, my friend, it's great to be here, man. I'm so excited about this. This has been a long time coming. I think we've been trying to connect for multiple years. Is that right? Yeah. And so many mutual friends who are like, you got to meet Rory, you got to meet Rory. And we finally met at the GLS this summer in August in Chicago. Yeah, I know. That's right. Yep. So it's been years in the making, but it's mm -hmm. going to be good. Good things to those who wait. So fantastic. Yeah. Well, it's always fascinating for me to see how people ended up where they are, especially with someone like you who found success, I'm, I'm going to say pretty early in life. So I'd love to follow the breadcrumbs. You want to tell us how you got to where you are now, a little bit about what you do, and then sort of back up and look at the breadcrumbs? Sure. Yeah. So um, I was raised by a single mom. Uh, my mom sold Mary Kay Cosmetics. So I am a pretty boy. I'm a mama's boy. I don't hunt. I don't fish. I manicure. I pedicure. I massage. I, you know, like these are the, th I know more about makeup than I do about cars. It's totally <laughs> true. Um, but my, my mom was in direct sales. And so I grew up going to all these like motivational meetings and stuff. And so I kind of grew up around personal development. And um, when I went to college, I got involved with a direct sales company and I went door to door, 14 hours a day, six days a week on straight commission, paying all of my own expenses. And um, I ended up doing it for five summers because I made about $250,000 doing it uh, over over the course of five summers, mostly from recruiting. So I was a I was a top salesperson, but I was I was the all time record holder uh, in leadership. And so I had I by the time I graduated college, I had like fifty seven students that I had recruited that were in this organization. And then I left that behind. I okay, can we stop for a minute? Can we just sure. pick that apart and then we'll, yeah, we'll let's go for talk some more bread door to door. Who wants to be a All door to door right. salesperson? Well, even before then, I got you took me back to my childhood. And like, I remember in the 70s and 80s, it was like pink Cadillacs everywhere. Did, yeah, did your uh -huh. mom ever get a pink no. Cadillac from Mary? She King? had a, no, she got the red Grand Am, which was like a level down. But only, oh, okay. I think she had, I think she got the Red Grand Am, but only for a minute. So she wasn't like super into it. She kind of right. dabbled, dabbled into it. But, um, you know, I, I remember early on, you know, my mom used to always say these things to me. I was in martial arts um, and I didn't like it. You know, I got, I, I, I remember what happened was, um, when I was 10 years old, I became the youngest black belt in Colorado to ever get beaten wow. up by a girl. Oh. And I got <laughs> beaten up bad in this tournament. And so I was telling my mom, I was like, mom, I don't like this. This isn't fun. And she used to always say the same thing. She would say, that's okay, Rory. Enjoying it isn't a requirement of doing it. <laughs> Enjoying it isn't a requirement of doing it. Um, and so I you know, started to develop this this passion for self-discipline and understanding how do I get myself to do things that I don't want to do. And then I, as I, you know, finished graduate school and, um, started, uh, became an entrepreneur in my earlier twenties, 
I started studying the psychology of ultra performers, these top one percenters. And I found there was all there were all of these consistent themes around self-discipline and doing things you don't want to do and how do you do that. And that became my first book, um, which was called Take the Stairs, um, which came out. That hit the New York Times when I was 29 years old. And that was, um, I had already been speaking uh, since I was 17. So it was like 12 years. And my um, my wife and I had built, um, so after that, that door-to-door college experience, I entered a contest called the World Championship of Public Speaking for Toastmasters because I thought, well, maybe if I won the World Championship I of speaking, I could like be a speaker. And I didn't win, um, but you know, there's 25,000 contestants from 90 countries, and I came in second place in the world when I was 23. Wow. And so then I was at this uh, uh, event, the National Speakers Association conference um, a couple of weeks later. And this gentleman walks up to me and he says, you're Rory Vaden, right? Uh, I said, well, yeah, yes, sir, I am. And he said, I, I heard about you. You're the, you're the Toastmaster kid, right? You were in the, the world championship. That's pretty cool. And I said, I, yes, sir. I, 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 that's me. I said, I'm sorry, have we met? And he said, no, we haven't, um, but I'd like to get to know you. And then he reaches his hand out and he says, my name is Zig Ziglar. <laughs> and wow. Uh, some of the young, some of the young ones listening may not know who Zig Ziglar is, but hmm. he became my personal mentor, Carrie, for um, yeah. about f- oh. four years. I would, I would uh, talk to him, and then I would travel with him. And he used to do these big events. You know, they were called Get Motivated events, and they were like arenas full of people. And I'd be backstage, just like him and Colin Powell and Barbara Bush, and you know, like, um, and uh, and so also around that time we started a sales training company because that was the only thing I knew was like how to sell door to door. And so, um, we started that company. We grew that for 12 years. That was where I met my wife. Um, it was an eight figure business. We had about 200 people on our team. And then we exited that company in 2018. We sold it. Um, and then we started brand builders group today, uh, which is what we do now, which is we help, experts to become more well-known. So the through line to all of it is I would describe my my expertise as the psychology of influence, Mm. which is understanding how do you get someone to take action? So I would say influence is the ability to move people to action, and that includes ourself. And so I think of the four levels of influence and level one is learning to influence yourself, which is self-discipline, getting yourself to do things you don't want to do, i.e. take the stairs to use the title of my first book. Level two influence is being able to influence one other person through a one-on-one conversation as we, I, I would call that sales. Um, mm-hmm. And we, we teach a curriculum. We have a program called pressure-free persuasion, which is you know, how to raise money from donors or how to sell high dollar offers or, um, but all in a very pressure-free way. Level three leadership, I or level three influence, I think of as moving a group of people to action, which I call leadership. And then level four influence is what I call moving a community to action, which is what personal branding is. And that's the work that we do today. Right. And so many of our, our clients are some of the biggest personal brands in the world. Ed Milet, Lewis Howes, mm-hmm. Amy Porterfield, Peter Diamandis, um, Matthew West is a client of ours. Many mm-hmm. of you probably know him. He's one of my favorite musicians. Um, you know, Eric Thomas, E.T., the hip hop preacher. Uh, mm-hmm. It goes on and on and on. John Gordon, who wrote The Energy Bus. Um, all these really incredible clients. Um, and it's really understanding how do we influence a community? But it's, it's understanding, I think my life has been, I'm just, I'm very much a student first and foremost, and I'm fascinated at how to get myself and others to take action. Wow. Okay. Well, we got an hour right there just to pick that apart. Um, I want to go back to when you were a teenager and I definitely want to hit on Zig Ziglar and then talk about the brands that you serve. Okay. But let's start, what motivates you? How many summers was that? Four or five? Five I did summers? five, so it was it was undergrad yeah. and grad school. So I did it. I uh, I I um, 
I did my, I graduated with an MBA and a bachelor's. So it took me five years to graduate, but I got both an MBA and a bachelor's. So I had five summers. And, and so I, I did that. Um, and, uh, you know, they take you to a state you've never been before. Okay. So back up even more, like why not flip burgers? Why not do the typical route? How did you get into, okay, money. So you were motivated financially. Yeah. So what happened was, um, my mom, you know, told me, she was like, you're going to go to college. You're going to be the first in our family to go to college and you will get a full ride scholarship because there's no way I'll ever be able to pay. Um, and that happened. I, I, became, I was valedictorian. I got a full ride scholarship, went to the University of Denver, but it didn't cover my housing and didn't cover like my, my books and my living expenses. And so I was on college campus one day this I was doing this this referee, this woman, her name was Tracy. She refereed my intramural basketball games. And she said, hey, I did this thing last summer where I made like $10,000. I think you could be really good at it. Do you want to come to this meeting? And I was like, $10,000? I was like, in a summer? So sure, like I'll show up. And they showed me this booklet of all these people who were the top performers the previous year. And there was a woman who had made $32,000 her first summer. And I was like, I don't care what it is. I'm in like, you know, as long as it's not illegal, I'm right. I I, I am in, I will do whatever you tell me, just tell me what to do. I will do it. And so I made like 17,000 my first summer. And then I made over 50,000 each summer thereafter. um, Because I was, I was selling and also I had recruited a large team. Um, but it was straight up doors slammed on your face, people spitting on me. Not, not, not very often, but I did have person spit on me one time. Um, and, uh, you know, getting the cops called on you, being chased by dogs, the whole thing. (sighs) What were you selling? Um, it was educational children's reference books. So they were like basically basic think encyclopedias. They weren't technically encyclopedias, but they were Mm kind of like that. Um, and, you know, the thing was, I never wanted to be a door-to-door salesperson, right? Like, that wasn't my life ambition. I mean, I was a normal child, Carrie. I wanted to sell Mary Kay. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, um, but I loved and I hated the job. Mm. Like, I did, I, I hated it. I cried every day, every morning for five summers. I cried. Like, I, I hated it. But I, I loved the person that I was becoming in the process it was so difficult of just hmm. getting the door slammed on your face over and over and over again. Um, but, you know, I needed the money and it exposed me to principles. Uh, obviously, I had been um, deep in scripture. I'm not a pastor, but I'm a hardcore Bible thumping Jesus freak. And um, I have been pretty much my whole life, other than a little stint when I was a teenager where I wasn't super active. But like, um, I've, I've, I've been close to Jesus my, my whole life. And, and, when I was selling books, it was a huge part of my faith journey because I I remember July 26th of 2001, which was my, uh, my 19th birthday. It was my first summer. I was, in, I was um, sitting on the corner of Buckingham Lane and Coral Court in Montgomery, Alabama, just realizing I hated the job. I wanted to quit. I wanted to go home. You know, I grew up in this little tiny town called Frederick, Colorado. Didn't even have a stoplight. So, you know, things are bad when you want to go back to Frederick, right? Like, I'm, <laughs> and, and um, it's now a booming area, Frederick is. But, um, you know, and I made this covenant with God that said, I can't do this. I quit. Hmm. Like, I don't have it in me. And so I made a covenant. And I said, if you want this to happen, this has to be yours. You have to take this um, because I can't do it. I give up. So you you have to make this happen. And um, and he did, right? So hmm. it it was I've I've always had that sort of strong sense of faith and um not growing up with a earthly father, you know, I think maybe it was one of the blessings in terms of like, you know, really has helped me always lean into my heavenly father. Um, yeah. So 
That was my door to door days. um, Because obviously, you know, the immediate motivation was money, but you're clearly a driven person, ambitious. I mean, other people would have just taken out a massive student loan. Other people would have found other things. But I mean, six days a week getting doors slammed in your face, getting spit on once, you know, like that, that perseverance is pretty unique. Do you know where the drive underneath all that comes from? Well, um, I really believe that the amount of our endurance is directly proportionate to the clarity of our vision. So if I have a crystal clear picture of what I want for my life and my future, then there is naturally a strong connection to how the sacrifices I'm asking myself to make today forward me towards that future. So it thereby creates this context for action to take place. Um, so in in Take the Stairs, we actually call this the paradox principle of sacrifice because people think or sometimes people will say, oh, I've always struggled with self-discipline or my, my kid struggles with discipline or this person on my team, right, struggles with discipline. And what we have found almost unanimously is that it's not that people struggle from a lack of discipline as much as they struggle from a lack of vision. Mm. They don't have a clear enough picture of what they want for their life, or they don't spend much time thinking about it, and so there is no reason to make the sacrifice, right? There's not a connection. There's not a connection to the long term. And and this is a place where our the, the biology, like our human brain is actually working against us because like the human brain is not programmed for success. The human brain is programmed for survival. Mm -hmm. Survival is about conserving energy, right? If you were stranded out, lost in the ocean, it's like your, your instincts kicked in, your brain is in life preservation mode, which is conserving energy, um, doing whatever you can to keep you safe, doing whatever you can to keep you comfortable. Left to our own natural design, like unchecked, we will default to to take, this is where we use the escalator metaphor. We default mm-hmm. to doing what is easy in the short term. But if you think about what it means to be a successful person, success is about doing, uh, it's about expending energy. It's about not being safe, but taking risk. It's about getting outside your comfort zone. It's not about doing what is comfortable. It's about doing, learning something new. It's exactly the opposite of everything that the, the, the brain is designed to do. Most of us have the extravagant luxury of living in a world where we very rarely worry about our actual survival. Hmm. We have the abundant opportunity to spend our time thinking about and pursuing success or visualizing it. So for me, I've always had a clear picture to answer your question about me. Yeah, yeah. Um, When I was, I started doing martial arts when I was seven years, five years old. And then I started doing Shaolin Kung Fu when I was seven. And I had this vision of being a black belt. And when I say vision, I don't mean like a vision statement. I mean like a picture in your mind. My my life, if you look at my life, take, take, take Rory, the teacher, out of it and just go like, if you look at my biography, my life is accomplishing a series of the next most seemingly impossible thing I could think of. Hmm. So I saw a picture of like, what if I could become a black belt by age 10? And I see this scene of breaking boards and testing and being there with my sensei and them handing me the black belt. My mom tells me I'm going to get a full ride scholarship, right? So I have this scene of I'm on graduation day, I'm valedictorian and they announce that I get this full ride scholarship and I'm seeing this, this happen. When I went door to door, it wasn't that I was like, Ooh, I want, it really wasn't the money. I mean, I needed money, but it was, they, they did this big awards banquet every year where the, the top person got to stand on stage and speak to everybody. Mm. And that was what I wanted. And so I had this, this visualization in my mind of like, 
that's it. The world championship of public speaking, even though I didn't win, I went twice. I lost twice, which mm. I say anyone can go once and win. It takes a real man to go twice and lose both times. But um, <laughs> I made it. And, and I mean, I made it to the top 10 in the world two years in a row. Um, and then I was the, the world champion uh, first runner up in 2007. So I was 23. But um, that was a there was a scene. And then, you know, shortly after that, I remember walking through the airport bookstore and grabbing a book off the shelf that said New York Times bestseller. And I remember holding my hand on the cover of this book and going, what would it take to have a book in an airport with my name on it that said New York Times bestseller? Mm -hmm. And so it starts with this visualization. The immediate thing that shows up after that is immediate disbelief. That's impossible. You don't know how, why you, you don't have the money. You don't have the connections, right? There's this immediate flood of, and, and, and what that is, is that doesn't, that's normal. That doesn't mean you're doomed for failure. That means you have a perfectly healthy, functioning, normal human brain. Why? Because your brain is designed to keep you safe. What keeps you safe is saying, think of all the terrible things that could happen. You can't do that. That's too risky. So that's your brain operating in a healthy way. But success is not ordinary. Success is not normal. Success is not average. And so to become a successful person, you have to literally rewire neurologically your own brain. And so that's what Take the Stairs ultimately became was these sort of seven key distinctions for how the world's ultra performers think. And so the picture, right, was I wanted to walk into an airport and, and see a New York Times bestseller. And so when I was 29, that happened. And then I wanted to sell an eight-figure business. And then, and then I got to a point where I realized, golly, my life has been a series of seemingly impossible goals one after the next. Except they were all about me. They were all completely self-centered. And um, so, you know, I, with the help of many, many mentors and pair, my mom and then the man that she eventually married who adopted me, who became my dad, um, and, um, you know, lots of mentors, lots of, lots of supporters and friends and fans. But like, you know, I basically woke up one day and realized like none of this None of this is, uh, you know, it doesn't last that long. You know, I remember feeling the first time that I got the news that I was going to be a New York Times bestselling author was like, I remember that moment. And it it lasted for a few days. Like that one lasted for a while, but it doesn't last that long. Now for me, I always, I've, I've always known and never tried to replace Jesus, right? For that. So I've always had a sort of a healthy relationship with achievement. But what I didn't really realize is going, man, the real feeling that is magical is there's nothing like the feeling you get when you help someone else succeed. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I think of like, you know, Maslow, you've seen Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. Okay. So we were talking about Ted talks, right? Cause you got, I don't know if I'm going to spoil it, but you got someone from Ted coming on the show here. Soon. I do No, That's okay. Yeah. Chris Anderson's coming on yeah. in a few months. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris will be on. And I told you, I said, Hey, you need to tell him my first Ted talk went <laughs> semi-viral. It's got like four and a half million views on how to multiply time, which is what my second book was about. But if I were going to do another Ted talk today, this is what I would do it on. I would, and I'm, I, I, I would show Maslow's hierarchy of needs of which at the top, he has self-actualization becoming everything you're meant to be. And I think this is, it's, I think it's a beautiful framework. I think it's helped a lot of people. I think it has, mm -hmm. is, is, is create a lot of clarity. But as I've gotten the privilege of pursuing so much of my own individual success and coaching other people, what I realized is that actually, I think Maslow was one rung short. It's not self-actualization that is the highest pursuit. It's others' actualization. In other words, it's helping other people succeed. That is a fire that never burns out. That is a well that never runs dry. That is a passion that you can chase for your entire life and get nothing but joy from. And so in the work we do at Brand Builders Group, well, part of what we help people figure out is what problem are they uniquely designed to solve? What mm. is 
what is God's divine design of their humanity? Because I think people ask the wrong question, Carrie. People go, what's my purpose? Um, and I think a better question to ask is, who can I serve? Because hmm. the sooner you get clear on who you can serve, the sooner you're going to find purpose. Because our lives have meaning in the context of other people. Um, like if if I'm achieving, there are wins and losses. It's right. competitive. But if I am serving, there are only wins. Hmm. And there, there is only success. And it never runs dry. It never, it never burns out. And so when I get clear, when I'm going, what's my purpose? What, what, what's my next thing? How can I grow? It's just see, it's self-centered. Um, but when I get into being others focused and others centered, um, that is where everything changes. And that's what we do today. Most of my, most of my thinking today is going, how do I help our clients to achieve? So like, you know, Ed Milet, we helped. Uh, we just helped him run his book launch earlier this year. He sold one hundred and seventeen thousand copies of his book. I mean, it was pre-sold, pre-sold. It was pre-sold. That's un insane. Insane. Um, Eric Thomas just hit the New York Times list. We've had four Brand Builders Group clients now that have had a, a TED Talk go viral. That we've helped them. They've had over a million views on their TED Talk. Like this is the, this is where you know outside of. Jesus being my number one obsession, hopefully, and being, you know, always a craving to read God's word and then a, a, a craving to know my wife uh, and to know my children and to be around. You know, outside of that professionally, it's going, I don't even care how big our business is. I don't care about the revenue and the money, but it's like, it fires me up when one of our clients wins. Nothing, like a revenue budget, I mean, come on. Like, not inspiring to me at all. But when one of our clients, their name is on a New York Times bestseller list or they're speaking on one of the world's biggest stages and we kind of had something to do, like, that fires me up. And so for all of us, you say, where did that drive come from? The first half of my life, it came from vision because the amount of our endurance is directly proportionate to the clarity of our vision. We're not struggling from a lack of discipline, but a lack of vision. You know, the last few years, it really has come from being, I think, of, of others focused. Um, it, it's come from service and going, you know, that's, that's, that's where all the action really is. How did you figure that out? Because it's it's like, you know, there's Bob Buford's quote. By being quote, a total self-centered jerk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. Good answer, good answer. Um, like, how did that manifest? Is that something you saw in yourself? Did other people say, hey, you're a self-centered jerk? Or like, what <laughs> what happened with that? Um, no, I mean, I, I don't, I, w I don't think I was, I, and I'm, I don't think I've ever been like selfish, right? Where it's like, I'm, yeah. I am, I am taking advantage of other people for my own gain. Sure, it's not, sure. it's not that I, I think people are self-focused or whatever you yeah, want to call it. I think it's right? just self-centered, yeah. meaning it was like, I was the center of my universe. I thought about what I wanted, what made me feel good, what made me happy. And to some extent, I think that's healthy. I think that's, a, it's kind of like, you got to put your own mask on first. I mean, that is true, mm -hmm. right? If, if I don't have enough money to pay my own bills, it's, it's hard to give so much money to like feed a country, right? Like yeah, it yeah. doesn't mean you can't give from what you have. And you know, you have the parable of the talents and all that stuff and you should always give, but it's just going like, I can't really give hundreds of thousands of dollars if I don't have them. So, mm -hmm. so I don't think it's, it's necessarily bad or wrong or unhealthy. I just think it's, it's immature. It's, it's early. And, and the, and, and the, 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 the place to get to is going, Oh, okay you know, how do I give, how do I give back? How do I bring other people with me? And I had a very strong sense of that. Even when I, I was in college, right? I was recruiting. I was bringing other people mm. with me. I got more joy out of helping them get, you know, a 5,000 or a $10,000 check there the first time than I did out of me, you know, getting whatever, a $50,000 check. It was, it was mm. seeing that, seeing that impact. But I mean, Functionally, what happened was I got married, right? Once I got married, I realized how self-centered I was because 
I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't just me worrying about me. Now I had to take into consideration this other person, like what they wanted to eat and where they wanted to go and how they wanted to spend time. Um, and then I had kids and I was just like, I mean, having kids has been the most difficult thing that I've ever done. Not because there's anything wrong with my kids. My kids are perfect. But what they have done is my kids have exposed a great weakness in me, which is that I spent, you know, 35 years of my life only thinking of me, never having to wake up in the middle of the night to take care of someone else, never having to be inconvenienced. And for me, I was so um, efficient with my time that anything that got in the way of how I spent my time, you know, I would basically just blow past it. And when you have kids, it doesn't really work like that. And so mm. I just, I just slammed into a brick wall of like, this is so hard and so uncomfortable. Why is this such a struggle? Um, and it's because, oh, they're slowing me down. They're inconveniencing me. They're preventing me from doing things I want to do. Mm. And it's like, oh, it's me, 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 me. Th like, they're preventing me from getting to worry and focus solely on me. That's not a weakness in them. That is a, a giant is a giant exposure of a weakness in me. Well, you know what's amazing is you're in your 30s when you discover no, this. No, I'm 40 and now. Oh, yeah, I was. You're yeah, 40 I, now. I just discovered 40. it in your... Yeah. Well, happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, in your mid to late 30s, right, is when you discovered that? Yeah, so we had Jasper. So Jasper is like five and a half. So yeah, so I was 35. 34, uh, 35. I mean, most people, if they come to that realization, because there's a lot of old self-centered people, uh, it's usually, you know, the 40s are pretty turbulent. And then it's in their 50s or 60s. They kind of go, wait a minute. This could be about someone else. So that's really cool. You found it. I want to back up again. Zig Ziglar. I mean, my goodness, he is Amazing. a legend. Seth Amazing. Godin gives him so much credit, as do so many others mm. for, uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think, it, I think it's a Seth Godin story about just listening to Zig Ziglar tapes. I don't know. I, I'll, I'll figure lots it out after. Lots of people have, though, but lots of people oh, listen yeah. to Zig Ziglar what tapes. What did you learn from Zig Ziglar? Okay, so here's what has stuck with me about everything that I learned from Zig Ziglar was... Um, off stage, okay, he was the same person he was on the stage, and that was super rare. And um, there were three rules that he had about his off stage living. Uh, and I don't ever think I ever heard him talk about these on stage, or but these were his these were his three rules. He said the first rule, he would never ever be alone one-on-one -on -one with another female other than his wife ever. So they he would not let a female come pick him up unless there was another person there. But he would never, ever be in a alone one-on-one -on -one situation with an, another woman other than uh, his wife and, you know, his daughter. Um, but like, so there was that. The other thing is he said he used to call the redhead, you know, Jean, um, he would call her every, when he was gone, he would call her three times a day whenever he was apart from her. So he wanted to talk mm -hmm. to her three times every day. And then he said, and I got to be home for church on Sundays. Those were like his wow. three, those were his like three personal things. And he would, you know, every time I would see him, he would like, Rory, don't forget, no, you know, no matter what happens, like these three things. <laughs> um, That's super cool. What made him remarkable? I mean, he is legendary, literally legendary. He died a number of years ago, right? Yeah. When did when did Zig die? Was it ten years ago? Yeah. Um. So so what happened was when he was like eighty four, he fell and he hit his head. And so I had really it was only like a few years before that that I had gotten to sort of meet him and get to know him. And then he fell and he hit his head and he lost his short term memory, which was uh, sort of a peculiar thing but very difficult for a speaker because he would be on stage, he would say something, and then 15 minutes later, he would say the exact same story that he had already told. And and that and that was really challenging, um, you know, and for a while, they, they uh, Julie, his daughter, would interview him and that worked, but then it was like, it, it just got shorter and shorter and then, um, you know, he passed away. But he, he, he uh, 
I mean, he was an he was an incredible man. Um, you know, I think those are the things that stick with me are, are who he was off stage, the relationship he had with Tom, his son and Julie and yeah. his wife. Um, and then towards the end of his life, I mean, he just was a flat out evangelist. Like he mm-hmm. didn't care about money or getting invited back or, you know, if a meeting planner got mad because he would say something about God or Jesus, he just didn't care. He was just like at this point where he's like, I don't care. I'm here. If, if you're going to give me a microphone, I'm going to tell people about Jesus. Um, you know, and that, you know, that really stuck with me. I've, it's been, a my whole faith journey. I would is like, like, I guess it's supposed to be like many people has been one of sanctification, right? This, oh, yeah. this, this gradual cleansing that I think my life, you know, the, some of the darker parts of my life very much fit that self-centeredness being, being one of these things. I actually just posted a blog today that I've never written about before, but it's it's called Seven Reasons Why I Stopped Drinking um, mm. and, and the three ways I was able to do it. And I've started to feel more promptings to be a little bit more bold on some of the more personal elements, you know, of, of things. Um, but, you know, that's probably one of the biggest, actually not probably and not one of, the biggest critique I get in my career is talking about Jesus. If you go look at my TED Talk, so my, my TED Talk's called How to Multiply Time. And if you read the YouTube comments, almost everything is positive. And then you'll see all this, why did he have to throw a Bible verse in there at the end? Oh, I didn't realize this was just, you know, a bait and switch, you know, for stuff, some pastor. If you read my Amazon reviews, um, it, it, it's it's like, oh, I thought this was a business book and he has, you know, too many references to the Bible or whatever. So, mm. and it's like, and I, and Zig just never cared about that stuff. And so I don't think I've ever cared about it because I watched him not care about it. And so, you know, I'm grateful for it because I've never agonized over those comments whatsoever. You mentioned stopping drinking. You don't have to go through all seven reasons, but what what were some of the what was some of the motivation behind that? Yeah, so there there were several. There were several. There were seven. Um, you know, a couple of them. What the catalyst for it? You know, I, it wasn't like I had this rock bottom. You know, thing. Mm-hmm. The catalyst was we got pregnant with Jasper, mm-hmm. our first, and so AJ was like, "Well, you know, I can't drink," and so I was like, "Well." Uh, solidarity, I'm not going to drink. And then I just never picked it back up. Right. So that was, and and I just, I, that, that was it. The last, the last drink I had was I had a glass of champagne the night we found out that we were pregnant with our oldest son. And that was the last time I had a drink. Um, and, and, uh, she told me on my birthday. So it also happened to be, you know, it was my, my birthday. So I remember the date because of that. But, um, there were a few things. One, one of, one of the things was I, I realized that everything, every regret that I had in my life, like every time where I had an, a behavior that I took that I wasn't proud of, whether it was like something I said or some way I acted or, you know, some relationship I had with somebody, a hundred percent of the times, a hundred percent of those regrets, I was drunk. Like uh, nearly a hundred percent was like, Oh, every one of these, I was drunk. The other thing was, um, I said this out loud to somebody one time. I don't remember what they asked. And I just told them, I said, I just have so much more fun when I'm drunk. And there was something about the way that I said it, where I heard myself say it. I was like, wait, wait a minute. I have more fun when I'm drunk. Meaning Hmm. if I'm going to have the most the the most fun I'm going to have the rest of my life, I'm going to have to be drunk in order to like have the most for the, like, that doesn't feel like a good. So it was just sort of like a disconnect. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, scripture, you know, there was some stuff in scripture that kind of was like part of it, but honestly, that wasn't super, <laughs> it wasn't, super, <laughs> Fair that, enough. wasn't yeah. that wasn't the super driving, mean, you know, the body is a temple and like, you know, all that sort of stuff. But, um, you know, Jesus turned water into wine and you know, there's like, um, you know, wine is a, wine is a gift. So it's, it's not a judgmental thing on anybody else. It was just, and then I had another thing was I met several influential people 
And then when I got to know them personally, I found out they didn't drink. So Lewis Howes was one of them, right? Mm. So Lewis hosts a very, very large podcast called The School of Greatness. Mm. He's our oldest client. So we've been working with him for over four years. Um, he just sold the podcast to Sirius XM for millions and millions of dollars. And he's got a big book coming out that we're working on right now for next March. Like, and anyways, like I found out like Lewis was this guy I respect and he's super young. He's younger than me. And, and I was like, you don't drink. He's like, yeah, I just, I just don't drink. Um, and then we had this friend who was a Navy SEAL for, um, like 24 years and he didn't drink. And I remember talking to him about it one time and he just said, yeah, you know, when you're a Navy SEAL, you just got to realize that in any given moment, it can become a life or death situation. Like this building could be on fire. Someone could walk in and start shooting at us. Uh, somebody might come up from back. And, and he said, and I just have to go, is being drunk going to help me if that, if I get in that circumstance or is it going to hurt me? And uh, I was like, yeah, well, so anyways, they just kind of started stacking up and then, and then we got pregnant and then I just sort of stopped. And um, so I, I think it, the, the other thing was I never drank just a little bit. I drank okay. for the purpose of getting drunk, right? Like mm. when I drank, which wasn't every day, but it was every week, um, you know, I, yeah, probably every week, like, and, and probably wasn't an off switch. It yeah. wasn't like a, you know, oh, you know, like AJ drinks now, right? She, 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 but she has a glass of wine, uh, you know, maybe two, but like it's very rare that she would drink more than that. But I didn't have that when I drink. It was like, all right, let's go, shots and whatever, or just like, you know, just drinking it like water. So, no, that's good to know. That's really good to know about yourself. Um, we should probably touch on branding. I mean, I, yep. marketing and, and branding. I mean, that, that would be great. This is just, this is a great conversation, uh, Rory. And thanks for being so transparent. Yeah. You're, you know, they, they said, they said, you know, Carrie, he's kind of like the Oprah of podcasting. Like he might go take you on different questions. Yeah, your team prepped me. So I was like, ah, oh, fine, wherever he wants to go. Um, uh, but so you kind of say, okay, what what's the through line between everything that we have talked about and like yeah, yeah, sure. at Brand Builders Group? Like, okay, you you help you help experts become more well known. So functionally, that help, we help people first of all get clear on their message and clear on who they are, and we call it finding their uniqueness. Um, then we help them extrapolate it into a body of knowledge. We help them create intellectual property frameworks, diagrams, charts, tables, you know, their content. Then we help them write and craft speeches. Uh, and we do mastery level presentation skills training stuff that I learned in my journey to the world championship of public speaking, like, you know, how to use the stage, the psychology of laughter and what causes audiences to laugh and, you know, how to gracefully sell from stage and all of these like advanced presentation skill sets. Then we teach people how to sell high dollar offers. We teach them how to do book launches, podcasts, and then um, funnels and social media and online marketing and digital marketing, right? So tactically those are all the th those are all the th the things that we teach people to do um but you go okay what what's the through line here well it's actually it's actually really really clear because so first of all we just we don't when people hear personal branding you know or like we're a personal brand strategy firm they tend to think either visual identity they tend to think like oh you guys do right. websites give me a logo or Give you do logo. logos. We don't even do that. That's not even one of, yeah. we don't, that, we don't yeah. do that at all. Um, uh -huh. Or they think, oh, you guys do social media. And it's like, no, nah, we don't even really do that. Like, um, here's how we define personal branding. We think of personal branding as simply the digitization of reputation. Okay. The, the digitization of reputation. So the, the personal branding is a new term, but like to us, that's, that's confusing. The word you really need to think about is reputation. What are you known for? How many, how well known are you, right? Like we help people become more well known. Um, so yeah, is social media a part, part of that? Sure. But like, are we, are we concerned about hashtags and, you know, whatever and understanding the algorithm? No, we're going, you know, what's your content strategy for making sure you're putting content out there and how are you monetizing that? But um, so Personal branding is the digitization of reputation. And here's what we have seen. Before you can ever have a strong personal brand, you have to have strong personal character. Mm. Like, you, your 
your my pastor, one of the things my pastor told me is he said that your influence will never grow wider than your character runs deep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Your influence will never grow wider than your character runs deep. So Zig Ziglar had strong personal character. And so his influence grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. There are other people in the world today that their influence has grown to be to outsize their character. And when that happens, there's a there's an implosion, there's a collapse, there's a breakdown. Um, and uh, again, that's just it's hard. I'm not uh, uh, it's not the judgmental. It's just there's difficult things that, that come up when that 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 gets out of whack. So you, you have to build a, a strong personal brand rooted in strong personal character and like um you know, like my wife is such a great example of this. So AJ, she's our CEO. We've been business partners since we were 20 years old. Twenty, She was 22, I was 23. Everything we've we've done, we've done together. And there's that uh, Bible verse, um, you know, a virtuous woman who can find her worth is far above Ruiz, the heart of her husband safely trusts her and he will have no lack of gain. And I go, oh my gosh, if there's one thing that has been true in my life, like it has been that, like a, a woman of, of, um, you know, a virtuous character and I've had no lack of gain, like in surrounding yourself with people of character, becoming a person of character. And that's the other thing is I've been in situations where I have been around people who did not have the strength of character re- proportionate to the amount of influence they had. And it was a bad, it was a bad, bad situation, bad stuff fell out of it. So I think that's that's the foundation is a, is a is a strong personal character. If you become famous overnight, it's not a good thing. Like it's a it's a problem. Um and then yeah, yeah, so go ahead, keep going. No, I, so anyways, that's the that's the connectivity between take the stairs and self-discipline and you know, like I think our, our, our work, you know, and AJ and I consider uh, like our family mission statement is like, we're undercover agents for God. So we decidedly want to keep our books on the business shelf. Um, and we decidedly want to speak at secular events. And our, 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 our company is, you know, decidedly quote unquote secular, even though everybody knows that it, it, it's, it's not, um, at least, at least we're not, we're very open about it, but, um, so, and I think too many people are focused on like how, how many they're 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 too they're too focused on the on the width of their reach and they're not focused mm-hmm. enough on their depth of character, um and and the depth of the people they're impacting. This so one of the things I posted on Instagram just a couple of days ago is I said don't be so concerned about the width of your reach, be more concerned about the depth of your impact. Because the algorithm, you know, people have this love-hate relationship with the algorithm. Like the algorithm is blocking me and, you know, the algorithm is making it harder to reach people and I'm, I'm blacklisted by the algorithm or whatever. Well, the algorithm does control a lot to how many people you reach, but it has zero, zero control or influence on how deeply you impact each person that you do reach. Mm -hmm. That is, and that is what we should be more focused on. Uh, and so, you know, that's part of the work we do at Brand Builders Group. And the, and the best piece of personal branding advice I've ever received, Carrie, this is this is not a, a Rory or a Brand Builders Group quote. Um, this came from a gentleman named Larry Wingett, who was another one of my mentors. Uh, and uh, the he he said this. He said, the goal is to find your uniqueness and exploit it in the service of others. Hmm. Find your uniqueness and exploit it in the service of others. And so four years ago, when we started Brand Builders Group, um, you know, we had been in the sales training space, so we had a non-compete, so we weren't going to go back into sales training. And so it was like, all right, what are we going to do? It's like, well, we should teach people how to do what we've done, write books, get book deals, get speaking engagements, grow their social media following, like monetize their personal brand, like build their reputation. Um, you know, these are things that, we know how to do that. We've never taught anyone to do or made a business. And and Lewis was happened to call us around that same time. And 
he was asking for some help. And so he became our first client. And then, you know, he had us on the, on his podcast the first time. And that was like the launch of the company. But they're, they're um, I think, so we developed a process. Um, we call it the Brand DNA Helix, which is these six questions that we take people through that help them identify what what is their uniqueness and what is what is the thing that they were meant to do that no one else can do. It's like it becomes their uncopyable difference. It's like, hmm. I mean, I, I would say it's it is it's God's divine design on your life of what He created you to do. And we just sort of take people through this process that reveals it for them. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the first part. That's the first part of what we do. So I don't know that this is an answerable question or not, because I get a lot of questions from young leaders who want to have an impact and who honestly want to have an influence and brand and the whole deal. And I always tell them, try to do something significant. Like, don't worry about the influence. Don't worry about how broad it goes. Sure. Just go deep, really help some people get committed to a cause and see what happens. Don't be dumb about it, but like just trying to grow your followers for the sake of growing your followers is something. But I'm really intrigued by, not a good idea I meant, um, I'm really intrigued by like that differentiation. So uh, mm. here's the perhaps unanswerable part of this question, but you've mentioned them by name. So Ed Milet versus Lewis Howes. On the outside looking in, you could go and say, well, there are two guys who interview really interesting people who are huge in the podcasting and the book space and the conference space. What's a differentiation? Can you, can you explain some of the nuances between like an Ed and uh, a Lewis? Because I think a lot of listeners would know exactly who he is. And that might, because, you know, the default is, well, I want to reach everybody. I want to reach the world. I want to impact the world. So help us understand where the brand distinction would be, even in two superpowers like Lewis and Ed. Yeah. Okay. So it, it matters. Essentially, you're asking, how do, what's, how do I find the uniqueness? What's, how do I find that point of differentiation, mm -hmm. right? What makes Ed different than Lewis and Lewis different than Ed? Sure. And what I'd say is the more important question is, how do you find what makes you different from Lewis or Ed in a way that it could help you grow to have the kind of influence that they do? So, uh -huh. so and, and here, I'll tell you the shortcut. So I told you there's six questions. So we yeah, have yeah. our whole experience, like the Brand Builders Group experience is 14 different two-day experiences. Wow. The, the first one, the, the entire first two days is just around helping someone find their uniqueness. But when we train our strategists, there's one shortcut that we've discovered. And so when we train our internal team, this is what we teach them because we have to teach them on how to like read this for people. And I'll, I'll tell you what it is, okay? And th we didn't know this, Carrie, when we started the company four years ago, but now we've, I don't know, we've probably had about 1,200, I, I should look it up, but probably about 1,200 clients that we've taken through this process. Wow. Um, we know this now. Here's what we know. You are most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. Mm. You're most powerfully positioned to serve the person you once were. Um, this is the ultimate hint and through line that we're looking for, is... It is figuring out what path have you walked down. The reason why Brand Builders Group is growing so fast is because AJ and I and our team were teaching people how to do things we've done. We have had viral TED Talks. I'm in the Professional Speaker mm -hmm. Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. We have built six different multi-million dollar businesses. One eight-figure business. We're about to have our second. Like we have, we have, uh, you know, launched New York Times best-selling books. We have sold millions of dollars from stage. We have done these things. And so when we're teaching it, when you hear it, you go, this is hitting me in a visceral way that's more palpable mm. and practical because I've been there and done it. So when we flip that and go, how do we do it for you? It's actually, it's incredibly difficult, but it's very simple. We just have to say, what, what obstacle have you overcome? What challenge have you conquered? What setback have you survived? And that is the problem 
that you can dedicate your life to because you're going to understand that person in such an intimate way that no one else in the world is going to be able to understand that person, right? So when you write copy and when you speak, when that person hears you, they go, oh, this person gets me. They understand what I'm struggling with. And they do because that 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 person is you. <clears throat> that person is an older version of you. Like uh in they now it's not age-wise, it just means they're on they're an earlier version of you. They're on in, at least in that relative journey, right? They're earlier on whatever journey you have been on. But when you just say, Oh, I want to start a podcast and I want to have millions of followers, <laughs> okay, that 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 ain't it. Like with right. yeah. with with Lewis, okay, we figured out that the problem that Lewis solves is self doubt. Because when he grew up, he was an awkward kid. He got made fun of in school, and then you know when he he got injured, he his whole life was playing football. All he thought about was football, football, football. And then he gets injured, and he has no other skills, right? And he just he has this this tremendous self doubt that he's ever going to make it or become somebody. And so when when Lewis interviews somebody, he's interviewing. We call this the lens. So this is something we teach in podcast power. So what makes interviews different is you interview them through the lens of your of your problem and they interview them through the lens of your uniqueness. So two different people, two different podcast hosts can interview the same person and they have two completely different conversations because their lens is different. Um, right a, on. A, a good example of lens is and and you know is think about like you know Rush Limbaugh, biggest radio personality ever. When people listen to Rush Limbaugh. They think they're listening to news talk radio, but they're not listening to Rush Limbaugh to hear the news. They're listening to hear Rush Limbaugh's take on the news. They want to hear his interpretation of the news, which means they're listening through his lens. Now, you wear glasses, right? So we actually describe this as like your left lens is the problem you solve and the right lens is the uniqueness. When I'm a host... I'm interpreting the world around me through my lens and my audience is standing behind me because they want to see the world through the way, like through the same lens. They want help interpreting how the world is happening. So when Lewis interviews Mike Tyson, that's what he's talking about, right? Is, is, is how did you overcome this? Mm. Ed approaches it from a completely different way. You know, every 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 one of our clients is different. All of our clients, we have about 700 active clients in our, our monthly coaching program. They all have a different lens. Now, in some ways, you know, one of the jokes we tell is we're all writing different versions of the same book. Like, we're all basically plagiarizing the Bible, you know, or pick pick whatever pick whatever ancient text you want to say. But it's like the principles are the same. But it's your uniqueness that matters. We call this the law of frequency, which means that we can be delivering the same source of truth, the same principle, hmm. but certain people will only be able to hear it from you. Meanwhile, other people will only be able to hear it from someone else. Why? Because they're, they're tuned into a different frequency, right? Somebody who can hear Tony Robbins say something, they go, eh, I don't really like this guy. But if Brene Brown says the exact same thing, they go, oh man, she yeah. is brilliant. Amazing. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, right? Um, it's kind of like, we call it the law of the frequency because think of it as a radio station. You could have two different radio stations playing the exact same song at the exact same time. Exact same lyrics and everything. Which song is the person going to hear? They're going to hear whichever station they're tuned into. And what we believe is that part of the work that God has prepared for you is that there are certain lessons that can all other people can learn and they can only be learned from you because they are tuned into your frequency. They jive with your style. They they go, oh, because I want to hear it from a black woman or I want to hear it from a middle-aged white guy or I want to hear it from someone who grew up poor like me or I want to grow up from someone, I want to hear it from someone who's single or someone who's a parent or someone who is an empty nester. They're hearing it 
through a frequency of you, which is really interesting because we all are frequencies, right? So um, you might think, well, what do I have to teach? Or, you know, why would anybody listen to me? And it's it's just a self-centered view. You only feel fear when you're thinking about yourself. When you go, I don't know, I'm not qualified. I don't think anyone's going to listen to this. Why would anyone listen to, to me? But you go, why do people go to church and listen to a pastor when they could read the Bible? Like they could read Jesus's mm-hmm. words directly. Why do they go to church? There's some other, you know, community and like, you know, fellowship and blah, blah, blah. But really they're going because they need the pastor's help interpreting Jesus's words and applying it to their life today. Right? So the Mm -hmm. messenger Mm -hmm. is like an intermediary. The messenger isn't the star. The message is the star. The messenger Mm -hmm. is the intermediary. Um, and, and you, and I would even say it's, it's, it's the, it's the receiver who's the star, right? Like your personal brand is not about you. Your personal brand is about the person on the other end of the microphone, the person on the other end of the camera, the person who's sitting out in the audience. And that person is struggling. I know it because we're living in a broken world and people are hurting. And that person that person needs you way more than you need them, right? Like you're going, oh, I want more followers. I want to make more money. That person might be going, I'm thinking about getting a divorce. I'm thinking about committing suicide. I'm thinking about leaving my family. And you show up and you have a day to reach into that person's life because they're tuned into your frequency and you hit them with something that completely changes the trajectory of their life. That's what you need to be thinking about. There is no fear when the mission to serve is clear. When you're thinking about that person, you don't care. Is the lighting right? Is my audio perfect? Is Am I going to say the right thing? Am I nervous? Just like if you were driving down the road and there was a, and there was a car turned over, you wouldn't be worried about, does my outfit look cute or is my, is, does my makeup look nice? Like yeah. you're going to help someone. Someone is in need. And so you're going to serve them. That is part of the amazing power of service, that when you live in this moment of service, all the fear disappears. There is no fear when the mission to serve is clear. And so if you're feeling fear, it's because you're thinking about yourself. It's because you're like Mm. who I was. You're self-centered. You're self-absorbed. Not selfish, not evil, just self-centered. You're thinking about you. And what you should be thinking about is who can I help? Who can I serve? What problem do they have? What questions are are they looking for? Because this is what it's all about, Carrie, is realizing that there is somebody out there right now who is searching and seeking and begging and pleading and perhaps on their hands and knees begging and praying for answers to questions that you know like the back of your hand because you've spent your life studying it. It's your duty and your obligation and your authority and your responsibility and I believe your divine calling to go serve that person. Love God, love others, right? Like, And so I'm not worried about the fear or what knowledge I don't have or I don't like the technology or I don't understand the algorithm or I'm not comfortable with this. All of that is irrelevant to the fact of we got to reach people. And if I'm a church, right, like, um, I'm going, I don't care what tool we got to use. Whatever tool we got to use to reach people is what we got to do. Like we got to like suspend judgment or concern about the vehicle and be like, I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm coming after somebody's soul and I'm going to go chase them down and I'm going to go get them. And so that's, that's what a mission, that's what it means to be a mission driven messenger. Oh my goodness. Uh, that is some of the best stuff on marketing I've ever heard. Rory, and it's funny, you just made my life flash before my eyes. (laughs) Never thought about this, but you know what the preaching hermeneutic was for me? What? It was the skeptical 17 to 21-year-old kid that I would subconsciously preach to every week. The kid who's thinking of walking away, the kid who's not sure it's true, that's why I have such a heart for skeptics. And what I do now, this podcast you know, Carrie Newhoff Communications, which is what we call my company. Why do I do the Art of Leadership Academy? Why do I do that? It's the 30 to 38-year-old church leader who was 
leading this growing thing who didn't know what he was doing and who would soon be burned out. And when I think about that, I get choked up. That's why I'm doing this now. I didn't realize that. But, you know, when we were talking about earlier, sort of our refined mission that we came up with just very recently in the company to reverse the decline in the church and help church leaders identify and break their next growth barrier. That's about me serving people who were like younger me because I I had to grasp for straws to figure that stuff out. Mm-hmm. And it fires me up. Mm-hmm. Does, is that what you're talking about? Yes, that's what I'm saying. You're most powerfully positioned wow. to serve the person you once were. That is where everything comes alive, and we—that's how you break through the wall. And and um, by the way, if if uh, if anyone wants to have a conversation with us about this, uh, mm-hmm. we do the first call for free with everyone. So if you just if you go to freebrandcall.com slash carry n, okay, for Newhoff. So carry C A R E Y. Don't have to spell Newhoff. Look at how we're not easy do, that is. We're not going to spell Newhoff. We're just going to say <laughs> freebrandcall.com forward slash carry n. We will do a free call with anyone who's listening, awesome. um, and we'll we'll start to guide you down to, to guide you down this path because it's hard to see it for yourself. It is difficult, but that's the the, the big the big hint. And and you go, it, it's a game changer, Carrie. Because here's here's the other yeah, thing. It's a game changer. That's here's, motivation. Like I want to do this for the rest of my life. You know, in one form or another, rather than just sit on the beach with my feet up forever. Like, right, right. It doesn't appeal That's to me. That's another great mm-hmm. example, right? Is people go, oh, like I just want to make so much money. And you go, uh, here's what I'd say. Do it one time. Buy a 10-day yeah. beach vacation. By day eight, you're going to be bored out of your mind. Like the first couple days are awesome. And then it's like, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, man, why? Because, I mean, we believe, like it's because God created us to work. God cre- that that work exists before the fall of man, right? Like work is mm-hmm. a part of our natural mm-hmm. design. It gives us meaning, not just money, not just, oh, this is how I'm going to retire. It's that there's nothing like the feeling you get when you add value to another person's life. Like that makes you whole. People are going, oh, I'm struggling with happiness. The reason you're not happy is because you're trying to find your own happiness. Go find someone to serve and do something that adds value to their life. I promise you happiness will show up. Like if you make an impact on somebody else, you will be happy. If you are trying to find ways to make yourself happy, you ain't never going to be happy. Like it's, (laughs) it's, it's, it's it's totally Mm -hmm. fleeting. And so that is the the design of, of 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 how this is all orchestrated, and so that's just like, you know, we want people to lean into that, and uh, yeah, it it changes everything. Wow. Well, I guess my last question is because we have pushed the boundaries of time <laughs> on this one. Uh, are you open to a round two at some point in the future? Heck yeah, like, let's do I it. I feel man. like we just scratched the surface. This is so, so good. Rory, thank you for what you and AJ do. Uh, thanks for building into our listeners. So tell us where we can find you on the internet. Give us that uh, free call URL again. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just say like, if, if this part is resonating with you about you, like helping you find your purpose and your calling, um, go to freebrandcall.com slash carry in. Um, if you're not so much into that, but you like the conversation around multiplying time and self-discipline and that, just go to RoryVadenBlog.com. And there's just, you know, lots of lots of free trainings and resources there. But um, if you kind of feel the calling, you know, and, and here's what we believe, Carrie. Hmm. We believe that the calling on your heart, like if you're listening to this and you're going, man, I'm feeling called to get my message out there to more people. We believe that's the result of a signal that's being sent out by someone out there who needs you. Mm. And and that person needs you more than you need them, but that's why it won't go away. The reason why that won't go away is because you're literally being called forth. There is a signal being sent from someone out there who is searching. They are searching. They are seeking. They are seeking some type of truth or wisdom that um, it's not that you're the only person who knows it. It's that you're the only person they can hear it from or you're the best person for them to hear it mm-hmm. from. And that's that's where that calling comes from because that is that is the, the expression of 
it's God's divine design of our humanity and and just going, I'm going to dedicate my life to finding those people. I'm going to dedicate my life. I'm going to find a problem where I wake up every day and I go, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with this problem existing. I, I'm not comfortable knowing that every day someone is struggling with something that I struggled with. I'm not okay knowing there's 17 to 21-year-old skeptics walking around whose eternity might be lost because they're skeptical like I was. Like, I'm not okay with that. I'm not okay with a, a young church leader like wanting to grow but not knowing how, right? Like, for me, I go, I'm not okay with somebody who feels called to get their message out, but they don't know the all the tactical steps of how to pull it together, or they don't feel convicted that there's something special or unique about them. And so what is that for you? Like, what is that problem that you would dedicate your life to? Because we think that that is, that's woven into your humanity from, from the creator himself. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's something very emotional and very beautiful about that and extremely clarifying. I mean, we were talking before we hit record about my last three months and just getting some more clarity on the vision, but I've been asking the big preaching question. And for the first time, I'm like, oh yeah, that's why I preach. It's like, yeah, that's great. Rory, this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for everything. And let's do it again. All right. You sign me up, brother. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. Thank you, Carrie, for having me.